Hello! Today we're reading the best Reddit stories and most top voted posts of all time. I present to you, doctors, nurses, Redditors, what has been your most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience? Oh, but we're not reading the post. One of the most famous Reddit stories comes from one of the comments that was so popular it's gained its own title as the Swamps of Dagobah. Oh, our nurse here, this is kind of a long one. I was taking call one night and woke up at two in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time, I lived in a town that had large populations of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Go to the hospital where a few more details awaited me. Perirectal abscess. For the uninitiated, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the butthole, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say, our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ER nurse said as she handed me the chart was, have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314-pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning, So after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get the circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10-minute ride to the OR, nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot, though. Chronic drug abusers who don't handle pain well and who have used so many drugs that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted, tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I'd been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I watched an 88-year-old man tear a one-inch diameter catheter balloon out of his penis while screaming, You'll never make me talk. I've been attacked by an HIV-positive neo-skinhead. I've seen some stuff. The other nurse had been in the OR as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at a level one trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army and averaged about eight words and two facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed. A little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart had noted that she'd been injecting IV drugs through her perineum. So this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad drugs. But overall, it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of, Oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at the exact same moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm. And just like that, all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to us, the infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, rotten tissue, and fecal matter that had seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mafia. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against a fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room, an easy seven feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator, not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction, she shot more of this brackish, gray-brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into the other nurse's shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away, jaw dropped open within my surgical mask, watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon standing on tiptoes to keep this stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh God, I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room, shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me, mouth still wide open, not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't breathe. My lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next, an ex-NCAA D1 tailback, his six-foot-two frame shaking as he threw open the door to the OR suite 
in an attempt to get more air in, letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus splashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head. Is this real life? In all operating rooms everywhere in the world, regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is. Everyone knows what it is for, and everyone prays to their gods they never have to use it. In times like this, we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to our central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept, and was greeted by an empty box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godless bastard who had used the last of the peppermint oil and not replaced a single fracking drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last meth user I can find, just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I can find, a vial of mastisol, which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but considering that over one third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. I started rubbing as much of the mastisol as I could get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be smelling anything except whatever slimy demon spawn we'd just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dousing the front of his mask in it so he could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that mastisol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this. But in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our OR suite and down the 40-foot hallway to the front desk, where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery, clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters 2, except dirty. Oh, so dirty. I stepped back into the operating room suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on a fan forum. Here's this one guy in blue surgical garb, standing ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah, except the swamps had just come out of this woman's butt, and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the inside of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. The front of his gown, a gruesome mixture of brown and red, his eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helped him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze, taped this woman's buttocks closed to hold the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped her off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. Turns out 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes four or five bottles to get really clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter in two and a half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning, the entire department, a fairly large floor within the hospital, still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all of the fluid and debris left behind. The OR suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits to healthcare talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen nothing, kid. <laughs> I really hope no one was eating. When I first heard the story, there were equal parts of dry heaving and hysterical laughter. There's no mystery why this story became so famous. User Banzai Panda became quite the Reddit celebrity and later ran their own Ask Me Anything with some fantastic insights and other short stories that should not be overlooked. First, let's start with an edit that I thought was really important to share before we get to the funny. Edit. I thought this would come up sooner or later through the questions, and it never did, so I guess I'll just put it here. I wanted to touch briefly on why it always seems like healthcare professionals in general, and I think in particular OR staff, are always in a rush. 
I've heard many patients complain about it. And now that our reimbursements from government and insurance companies are tied to patient satisfaction scores, I think I would be remiss not to address it. The simple truth is, surgery is expensive, like $50 to $250 per minute expensive, depending on what you're having done and when you're doing it. My average patient interview lasts less than five minutes, and in that five minutes, I really only need to ask about six questions. The rest I can get from your chart after you're asleep. So while it may seem like my colleagues and I are just cruising by you without much interest in your personhood, the truth is that we are busting our collective butts to try get you in and out as quickly as possible, because this is an expensive game to play. I've seen nurses take upwards of 10 and 12 minutes while talking to patients, and all I can think is, do you want them to be able to pay rent next month? It's not that we're not listening. It's not that we don't care. The faster we do our job for you, the better off you are. I wish there was a better way to explain this to patients when they come in the door. But as things stand right now, this is the best I can do. But Herd Dweller wanted to know, what's the most unusual thing you've taken out of someone? OP said, baby carrots out of a bladder. Happened on both a man and a woman, separate occasions, but I've always wondered if they knew each other. We found a sewing needle buried inside a woman's fat rolls. We once had a guy get a dildo so far up his rectum that we had to cut him open from the front and milk it out by hand. The team in the room at the time took bets on what color it was. Someone replied, I'd imagine it was brown by that point. Edgar asked, what was their excuse? Also, ever heard any really, really bad excuses, or are people generally quite forward once they get themselves into trouble like that? OP's reply, I never heard what the carrot bladder alibis were. I had one lady whose arm was covered in massive boils, so much so that the skin was beginning to shear off in big sheets as it leaked pus and blood. I asked point blank if she had ever used IV drugs, and she promised that she had been bitten by a spider while cleaning out her garage. We found the track marks on her arm after we put her to sleep. Another guy, whose leg we had to amputate throughout a series of surgeries, claimed it was all the surgeon's fault. I asked the surgeon about it later, and it turns out the guy had started out with a small infected cut on his groin, nicked it working on machinery or something like that. He'd come in for some antibiotics, refused to finish the medications, then waited until there was nothing more we could do for the leg, and proceeded to threaten to sue anyone and everyone involved in his care for carelessness. People give information as necessary, usually, and not much more. The guy with the broken penis? We were all so embarrassed for him, and I was sure that someone else would have figured out what his story was, so I never asked. It's probably my greatest professional regret. (laughs) All I know to this day is that the woman who brought him in was not his wife. A.K. Mumbles asked, have you ever witnessed an instance of negligence by a surgeon? How often did it happen and how bad was it? OP's response, it wasn't in my room, but I was next door when we had a cardiac surgeon leave a sponge inside a patient. We use special gauze that has a wire threaded through the weave, so if one goes missing at the end of the case, we can shoot an x-ray of the patient and it'll show up. They shot the x-ray, the radiologist confirmed that the sponge was inside of the patient, The surgeon argued that the patient was actually laying on top of it, and in spite of protestations, he closed up the patient and sent them out. Did the exact same thing not a week later. I heard later that he tried to claim that somehow he hadn't been fully informed of the situation, which was a very unfortunate line of BS. Management later installed microphones and video cameras in every room, for educational reasons, they told us. And now for OP's final comment. All great questions, and in exchange for your one-up vote, I will give multiple answers. 1. We had a young kid come in after a cliff diving accident. Pro tip for amateur cliff divers, don't dive headfirst until you've tested the water. Two of his vertebrae had burst, as in shattered, and he'd already been in the ICU for a couple of hours due to some cluster frackery of paperwork and indecision. We had a locums tenon surgeon on call for that night. A locums is a temp, so he wasn't one of our normal staff. This surgeon was a dick, capital D, capital I, capital C, capital K. Because of the nature of the injury, we had to put in a breathing tube while the kid was still awake, which is nerve-wracking under good circumstances, and becomes even more difficult when the patient is young, hypothermic, scared, has a broken neck, is in a cervical collar, and is still covered in sand from the beach. The icing on this crap cake 
was that the surgeon came into the room and started yelling that it was too warm to operate, and until we cooled the room off, he refused to pick up a scalpel. While he's going on his sweaty-browed tirade, this kid is still completely awake and fully aware that if we don't get working ASAP, he may become a quadriplegic in a hurry. We eventually got the kid off to sleep okay, but wound up having to call in one of our regular neurosurgeons because our temp decided this was more than he signed up for. The anesthesiologist and I reported the frack out of him after the case was done, and he was eventually banned from working in our hospital. Fortunately, because of some very crafty HR laws, we're not allowed to let other hospitals know what a bag of he is. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.